So this video is about the game Superman for the Game Boy, which I feel I should mention up front has some pretty intense flashing effects at times, if you're sensitive to that sort of thing. But before we get to any of that, I want to take a moment to talk about Superman for the Nintendo 64. If you've heard of the latter, then you know it's routinely talked about in the context of being one of the worst games of all time. And there are numerous reasons why that's the case, but that's not the point of this video or this introductory tangent. The reason I bring up Superman 64 is because I watched a video that went over the history of the development of that game, and while I remember AVGN mentioning the developer Titus, as he called it, I hadn't thought about the fact that they might have also been responsible for the Game Boy version of Superman as well. I never had a Nintendo console growing up, only Nintendo handheld, so my personal history with the Superman games is that I only ever heard of Superman 64 as an adult in the context of it being such a notoriously bad game. But on the other hand, I actually had Superman for the Game Boy as a kid, and if I'm being honest, I can't say that this was particularly memorable for me. Not like Kirby's Dream Land, Pokemon, Super Mario Land 2, The Six Golden Coins, Super Mario Land 3, Wario Land, which might be my favorite Game Boy game that I ever played in retrospect, but man, I hate that title. I just call it Wario Land or Wario Land 1. You get the point. Superman, though, was just one of those games I had. I played it some, never really got far, and yeah. But as a kid, I don't recall thinking it was a bad game particularly, just difficult and or boring, perhaps? I don't know. But as an adult now, knowing that it was made by the same developer a couple years before the infamous Superman 64 was released, really had me curious enough to try it again. If it weren't for the fact that it was made by the same developer, it wouldn't have even occurred to me to even consider doing a video on this one. So let's get started. After the game's opening developer credits, yeah, there's Titus, you see a picture of Superman and I'd say that the pixel art looks fine, and I always thought that the way this game sounded was kind of interesting. Of course, what we're ultimately judging here is the gameplay. So then there's a brief synopsis of the first level. The first line makes sense, although I don't know why I have to find four keys. The only reason you'd need to collect keys, as far as I'm concerned, is if they stole those special kinds of keys from a nuclear launch facility or something. Okay, now that the level has started, I don't want to say that the graphics are bad exactly. Superman just looks weird. I think it's the bright outline around him, but it's either that or have him blend in more with a dark background, so I'll take it. I mean, the background could have been lighter, but if they're going for a darker atmosphere overall, then sure, whatever. To be honest, my first impression, for maybe the first 10 seconds or so when I started playing this again for the first time in... however many years it's been, was that the control actually felt satisfying. But hold on to that thought, because we'll return to it in a moment. Anyways, you hold the A button to fly up and B punches. I forgot that if someone shoots at you, you can literally punch the bullet right back at the bad guy and kill them. That's so cool. Then my first moment of mild annoyance came when I tried to get this object, but it blew up and hurt me. In retrospect, it looks like a grenade, but why would a grenade be suspended in midair like that? You can't punch it either to get rid of it, so just avoid them. You can also get hurt by just touching enemies, which is standard behavior for a video game, but come on, he's Superman. I can understand why bullets should hurt him in the game, even though they just bounce off of him in the comics. It's a balancing act of taking a bit of liberty with the source material and not making the game too easy. So I don't mind that compromise in particular, but just bumping into a guy? Oh look, they misspelled Fortress. And this is what the continue screen looks like. You'll see it pretty often when you play this game, so get used to it. Ah, shit. That was pretty much immediate, and I should have known better, too. Speaking of taking damage, I wish the health bar was divided into segments so I know how many hits I can take before I die. All you need is a single line of white pixels between each bit of health that you have. So how many hit points do you really have? Well, I hate to give you this kind of answer, but... It depends. Okay, really, I don't know exactly how the health bar works. What I do know is that Superman can go from full health to death after taking nine bullets, but he can only take eight grenade blasts. And if you get a mix of different hazards hurting you, then who knows. Sometimes you visibly lose all of your health bar, but you don't die. 
as if the game is okay with you having zero health as long as your vitality doesn't go into a negative number. Now you know how in most games after you get hit you have that after hit invincibility for a couple of seconds or so? Well, it's sort of here in this game. I say sort of because the grenades can still get you. That is the biggest load of horseshit I've ever seen. Seeing Superman get hit so much in Flash as a result reminded me that pausing is also literally a trippy experience. When you hit the start button, the music keeps playing, but the screen starts flashing rapidly. I probably thought that was cool as a kid, and I guess I still do now, but why do that? It's even more stressful on the eyes when playing on an emulator, because then you're playing on a larger screen that's backlit rather than a dull and tiny Game Boy display. I mean, I know backlit screens weren't a thing on Nintendo handhelds back then, but you can see why this needed a seizure warning. Also, I didn't realize this until I played this game on a physical Game Boy again to record a few clips, but those bullets are much harder to see here compared to an emulator. They look damn near invisible. It's like playing on an emulator is the ultimate cheat code. So anyways, you gotta collect four keys. Some of these are out in the open and others appear when you kill certain enemies. Which, as far as I can tell, are the same enemies each time rather than being random, but I'm not sure about the later levels. I also find trying to punch the snipers that are leaning out of the window somewhat awkward while flying. It seems like I get hit half the time. Oh, by the way, speaking of flying, the speed at which you fly is exactly the same when you're walking. That's... kind of shitty. I say kind of because on the one hand, making him fly too much faster would probably be a train wreck every single time if you're trying to avoid obstacles and bullet fire with the screen scrolling twice as fast or whatever. On the other hand, making him walk more slowly would just feel tedious, so... It feels a bit disappointing, but I'm not even sure what to suggest. In any case, you can move vertically, so... yeah. Also, when you fly up and touch the top of the screen, it's suddenly really obvious that a few pixels are flickering around the underside of his body, which really bothers my OCD. I figured only the cape should be moving. So I get the four keys, then you gotta make your way to this flashing platform at the far end of the level. I don't know what it's supposed to represent. You touch that, and Superman looks like he turns into a ghost and flies away. I don't know what it is, but as a kid, that visual creeped me out a little bit for some reason. Just a combination of the way he freezes into that pose and then just smoothly moves up the screen while he's stiff as a board, I guess. Anyways, the game says, well done! Then you get the synopsis for the second stage, and this time you've only got two keys that you need to find. Then the second stage begins, and the instant you take flight, the screen starts auto-scrolling. I'm starting to find this increasingly difficult now. While I can get through this level in one life, I still get hit a lot. I think it's actually easier to wait for these guys with jetpacks to fire a bullet at you and then deflect it back at them rather than just trying to punch them directly. Fortunately, there's jewels scattered around in the sky and touching one of them restores some health. But unfortunately, sometimes there's a guy waiting near most of the jewels that'll shoot you anyways, so odds are that if you get the jewel, you'll also get hit. So the pros and cons of trying to get that item might cancel each other out. Especially since a lot of the jewels are really close to the bottom of the screen and, regardless of whether or not it would make sense in any other context, flying too low off screen means instant death, even for the mighty Superman. I guess he's really sensitive to sudden changes in atmospheric pressure, huh? I didn't quit the fight. What kind of message is that? You frustrate the player with bad controls and then insult them even further? It would have been nice if, for this kind of level, Superman could fly straight and maintain a certain altitude on his own and you could just change his elevation with the up and down buttons on the D-pad. That'd be a lot better than constantly holding and releasing the A button. I'm just wildly moving up and down all over the place and that does not bode well for avoiding enemies and their gunfire. Or for grabbing items that are damn near at the bottom of the screen. The control in this regard literally reminds me of that infamous mobile game Flappy Bird. And if my mind goes to that sort of comparison, then like... Fuck. Speaking of items, there's one item that looks like a small man. If you manage to grab that without killing yourself somehow, Superman's body starts flashing rapidly and it turns out that that item was an invincibility power-up. Great. Although I wish we had gotten a separate bit of music to go along with that. 
because if done right, that can clue you in on when the power-up is about to run out. Take Super Mario Land 2, the six golden coins, as an example. I'm gonna grab this power-up, and just by listening to the separate tune that plays when you're invincible, you can tell when the effect's about to wear off. The reason that's helpful is because it gives you a brief moment of time to subconsciously be like, oh, it's about to wear off. Do I really want to charge towards that next enemy with reckless abandon now? I guess not. The Super Mario Land 2 example even gives you a couple seconds of silence in between the music stopping and the visual feedback of Mario flashing also stopping to really make sure you have a chance to get ready for that power-up's effect to finally stop. It's just really good design, as expected from a first-party Nintendo game. In Superman, you get the visual feedback, sure, but given that the control is much less precise anyways, I'd still just err on the side of caution and pretend like you can still get hit. You still have to punch them anyways, or else you pass through them like a ghost, which is pretty annoying. They don't give you the special music or the Grim Reaper's touch of death like in Mario. I can't think of any other game off the top of my head where you still have to explicitly attack an enemy like normal while you're invincible in order to kill them. In a Mario game, or pretty much any other game, you just touch them and they die instantly. Which is pretty fair, given that without invincibility, they hurt you on contact anyways. Also, I should point out that there's other ways to do the whole invincibility music thing. In Kirby's Dream Land, the special music stops abruptly and the main music comes back without warning, but the visual feedback still persists for a couple of seconds, so the player still has a chance to react and adapt to being vulnerable again. I know I keep going on and on about this, but I can't help myself. It really bothers me. Anyways, I said earlier that my first impression of the controls were that they felt satisfying, but that impression has long since worn off. Back then, when it was level 1, it was easy, as it should be for pretty much any game's first level. I could fly if I wanted, despite how obviously it was flawed. Walk on foot if I wanted, I got to practice punching bullets back at people, etc. But now that level 2 has me fucked up, I honestly just don't like it anymore. I mean, punching bullets back in an enemy still feels good, but that's assuming it works at all. I must have just gotten lucky on level 1. That and the fact that it's much harder trying to punch a bullet back when you're trying to fly without the ability to stay level with your enemies. This game is rather strict with how much leeway your fists get with the hit detection. So I make it to the end of the stage, and fortunately both keys that you need to find are at the very end of the level, where the screen stops scrolling. So it's impossible to accidentally miss one, but that's really the only good thing I can say right now. Okay, third level. You're in a warehouse and you fight a robot or something. You gotta get two keys. And I guess this is my own fault rather than the games, but there's these ladders and even though I can fly and all that, I still instinctively stop in front of them and hold up on the D-pad to try and climb them. But flying is preferable anyways, at least in this context, so whatever. On the other hand, while you can fly up a ladder, you can't fly down it again. Sure, you can always just find another way down, but I don't know, I just find this a bit weird and annoying regardless. I guess they're technically part of the background rather than being anything your character's programmed to interact with, though. But what's not part of the background are these electric beams. They switch on and off in regular intervals, and they do give you enough time to move past them when they're off, so... Despite the terrible flying controls, they're not really that big of a problem. In the bottom corner of this level, there's a switch that says off, but I can't punch it or anything. Oh, I guess you just step on it. They like to hide jewels down here where you wouldn't necessarily see them because you're constantly flying up against the ceiling during these parts of the level, but they're there if you need them. And then there's a second switch you gotta walk on before doubling back to the beginning of the level to take a different route that was previously blocked by electric beams that were constantly on. I guess it's not too difficult to figure out. I don't think I'm that smart, so if I figure something out like that, I can't say with much certainty, you know, how easy it really was to think your way through a puzzle. Oh, look! He's just gonna stand there and keep shooting bullets into the floor. I could go around the electric beam, but let's try this. Fuck, he got me anyways. That's weird, I'm supposed to collect two keys, but I found a third one anyways. Whoa! 
That was close. Let me show you how lucky I got there, and how weird the collision detection is in this game. Woo, look at me, my feet... No, half my leg, pretty much, just passes through the grenade. That was fun. Let's do that again. Oh shit, the fabric of the cape brushed up against it. Or maybe Superman farted on it, who knows. Come on, shoot a bullet. I don't want to fly... Damn it. Then I get to a boss, which honestly isn't that difficult. You just spend a minute punching it repeatedly. Seriously, this is much easier than trying to hit a regular bad guy while flying. And what makes Stage 3 so special that it gets a boss at the end? I don't know. This boss is actually so easy that it wouldn't have felt out of place in Stage 1, to be honest. Although, if they had a boss in Stage 2 and it was hovering in mid-air, that probably would have been nearly impossible to hit before you ran out of health. So maybe I should consider myself lucky. You know, it was actually shit like Stage 2 that made me look online for some cheats, but the only thing I found was a level select code that didn't do shit. Then I eventually found a cheat code that was five whole separate lines, but despite it being so long, it's not very comprehensive, since it only protects you from bullets and touching enemy sprites. So grenades, electric beams, and falling down the bottom of the screen still gets you killed. And you know what sucks even harder? These cheats somehow make the flying control even more bouncy than before. Well, sure, the bullets and enemy sprites aren't hurting me, but despite constantly holding down the A button to fly up during this trial run, I still get forced down and killed again. This game is so bad that even the cheats suck, so fuck them. I even tried using Visual Boy Advance's Memory Viewer to look for patterns and numbers to see if I could give myself more lives or health or whatever, but I don't know anything about programming, so in the end, the only modification I was ever able to make was to change a bit of text using a hex editor to make stupid shit like this. Yeah, I'm real clever. But now it's time for an underwater level. Uh... Is it bad that I'm using the words stage and level interchangeably here? Eh. So here's stage four, and this may have been as far as I ever got as a kid, I don't know. The health bar is on the top of the screen now and shifted to the left for some reason. I don't know why. In order to kill sharks, they need to be punched twice. Why? Yeah, who knows? You may as well do it though. Some of the keys are probably hiding inside one of them, but I feel kind of bad about doing it. Unless you bump into one of them by accident, the sharks don't hurt you. They just swim around and do their thing and ignore you by default. After you punch them once, they try to swim away from you like they're scared more than angry. Poor animals. And the wavy animation that just dominates this level makes sense since it's underwater and all that, but after a while it just gets tiring to look at. And the speed of the waviness seems to vary depending on how fast you're moving, especially vertically. It's a cool effect given that it's the Game Boy, but I think I prefer when it's used more sparingly like a psychic attack in Pokémon or some part of an overworld like in Wario Land. The music for the stage, on the other hand, is... actually pretty catchy. One thing I like about this game, the music is decent enough and they don't recycle the same song for every level. We're on stage four now and so far we've heard four different pieces of music. There isn't really much more to say about the level though, so let's get out of here. Okay, fight the invaders, blah blah blah. That's a lot of text just to tell you that stage five is simply another flying level. I've mentioned before that deflecting bullets is harder when you're flying. When you and the enemy are on the ground, you're the same height, and your fist automatically seems to line up with the horizontal path that the bullet takes as it flies towards you. When flying, though, good luck lining anything up. And how the hell did I manage that? It's like I bounced two bullets off my knee. I didn't even know he shot a second bullet. I probably just got super lucky when tapping the B button frantically. Not to brag, but I'm kicking ass. Ah, fuck, I died again. That would have been cool if I could have finished the level with an empty health bar, though. Apparently, there's this glitch where if you finish one level with an empty health bar, you start the next level with a full health bar again. Let's 
some crazy shit. I swear to god I didn't edit that or anything, that's really how it works in this game. But back to the other flying mission that is stage 5. This time I'm gonna try to just lay low. Later on in the stage, if you stick near the bottom of the screen, you can avoid most of the enemies and their gunfire. There's also a jewel near the bottom of the screen later, too, for what that's worth. Also, once again, both keys that you need to collect are at the end of the level, so you can't miss them. Why not just one key? Or none at all? The whole point of this level is to get through the enemies and their gunfire, and since the screen auto-scrolls, there's no element of actually searching for anything unless you stumble across a power-up by accident. I'm trying to get this one without dying. Come on, there we go. Having keys seems pointless if you can't roam freely and explore. Okay, now we're in stage 6, and I want to say that I'm pretty sure I never saw this level as a kid before. Maybe. Why are they interested in species conservation if they're willing to do something as heinous as blowing up the entire planet? In any case, this is definitely my least favorite level, and in my opinion, probably the most difficult. Why? Because it's a maze and I can never figure out where to go. Even though I've played this multiple times now, I still don't really have a good sense of where any passageways lead. This first grenade forces me to fly up against the ceiling, but once I clear it, I shoot up the column, and then when I descend back, the alien respawns in its default location, so I don't know how to hit this alien without taking a hit. It took me a lot of playthroughs before I finally managed to get through this bit without taking damage. Why would they have grenades hovering in midair inside their air-locked space station anyways? Oh yeah, and the enemies are more difficult as well, so that also sucks. Both the aliens and the crab robots that shoot bullets at you both take two punches to defeat. But those crabs, you can't hit them by deflecting a bullet back at them. You've got to crouch while punching them because they're so low to the ground. It doesn't even look like it's shooting bullets, it looks more like it's flinging pieces of chalk at me. That's some juvenile shit. But it hurts Superman all the same in this game, so I guess I can't blame them for being economical with their weapons. Oh look, another crab. Oh hey, there's a grenade in the way that I would have to fly over. I'll try going somewhere else then. Eh, this stage might give you a Metroid vibe at least. How did I even get hurt? I genuinely don't see how I got hit here. Sometimes I review footage, and upon closer inspection, I can see something along the lines of where I was just unlucky enough to not have been a split second faster, technically. But I really don't see what I did wrong here. But okay, I got hit, but I also landed a hit on it as well. Just gotta punch it one more time. Get over here. Aw, oh, you fuck. That blows. I mean, not that it really mattered to me a whole lot in that particular case, since I had a bunch of health and continues during this playthrough, but... That's basically the reoccurring frustration you feel when you play this game. Also, watch this. The aliens can touch the grenades without getting hurt. Fuck. That. The alien's attack involves them extending their neck. Maybe it's supposed to be a headbutt or they charge at you a little bit? I don't know, it's weird. Sometimes they also look like they try to karate kick or something. I'm not even sure how they hit me sometimes, even though I'm punching as fast as I can. Maybe the timing of the hits is more sensitive than I realized. Oh, there's an alien. Shit! That's another problem. You can't really see what's below you. Or if you can, the flying controls are broken enough that you can't do a proper descent. So you gotta try tapping the A button to lower yourself down a bit more slowly. Ah, shit. I got hit once by this stupid ass, and I got hit again! He must have kicked me in the balls. But how did I punch him from that far away afterwards? Also, how did I get hit the first time, though? I was flying down, or falling, whatever, and, uh... Ah, I see. My fist brushed up against his ass and then touched his ankle. Another thing I've noticed with enemies that take more than one hit is that if you or they move far enough away that they go off screen briefly and then come back, they seem to be full health again. Because there were a few times it seems like I had to hit the same guy three times in total. And it looks like I'm proving my hypothesis correct here. Alright, gotta punch this one out. Fuck. Unbelievable. Like I said earlier, this is a maze and I can't figure out where I should go next sometimes. At least it seems like enemies don't respawn after you kill them, because there are quite a few passageways now where I don't encounter anything. Which is a relief, but I'm basically wandering around aimlessly until I find another key or the blinking platform. Good thing this game doesn't have a time limit. 
But yeah, I got the last key now, and I think that platform shows up in the large room I was just in a moment ago. Good, there we go. That was terrible. Stage 7. Stop the invaders from terrorizing Metropolis. Of course, in reality, you don't have to stop these invaders from doing anything, just find the stupid keys. So there's an invincibility power-up right at the beginning of the stage. Just fly straight up and it'll be in the corner of the screen. Once you get it, though, I have to admit that I'm not really sure what the best strategy is. You try to punch out as many guys as possible to search for keys, which is difficult because they take three or four punches until they're dead. Or you can try to grab as many jewels as you can, which might only be a good idea if you start the level in low health. I'm not sure. Well, a lot of good that did me. I had invincibility, a bunch of health replenishing jewels, and it still wasn't enough. I don't know which person decided to not have enemies die instantly when you touch them while invincible, but I hope they shart. Okay, anyways, grab that shit and try to find your keys by punching these guys on their hovering motorbikes or whatever. Or not, I don't know what to tell you, other than two of the keys are near the end of the level at least. But that was cool, I found one already. At least they're generous with how many jewels they give you. They're all floating in the sky among the enemies rather than being on the ground, though, so... Yeah, unlike what the stage synopsis said, you don't have to stop these enemies from wrecking havoc on the city. Just grab the keys and fly away after touching the platform and leave them to do... whatever. Stage 8, for whatever reason, I find rather easy. The intro says you need to explore, but the level layout is mostly linear. All the hazards are either the guys in trench coats that shoot bullets at you, and you should be pretty good at punching their bullets back at them by now if they're not situated anywhere weird. And of course, you have those electric zapping things, too. Now, like I said earlier, there's no time limit, so just take it nice and easy here. I mean, I look like a dumbass at the moment getting hit twice like that, but honestly, these are all hazards we've encountered before, so it's not really a big deal. Yeah, there's also narrow gaps like this that Superman has to crawl through, so that's different. You don't even need to know any special controls in order to crawl. Just walk into a gap and the game makes you crawl automatically. So that's nice, but the level gets kind of fucky later on with the enemy placement. But at this point, it's like, whatever. I just want to punch the bullet back at him. But I'm gonna have to fly over this thing. Fuck! It, I didn't even make it over the zapping thing. Well, that was pretty lucky I didn't get hit a second time. Okay, fly over and... Piece of shit! Oh right, that steel beam is just part of the background. Unlike this steel beam. That's always fun to try and figure out. Well, I already found all four keys, so that's good. Oh yeah, there's also a dead end with a room full of grenades and an invincibility power-up. Uh, great, thanks. Is it even possible to get that power-up without getting hit? That's when I found out that you can't fly through these electric beams when you're invincible. You just bounce off of them, which is really annoying. Son of a bitch. Stupid asshole. <laughs> Look at that guy. He's just shooting into the corner of the wall. What? He still got me. Look at this dumbass missing me at point blank range. Oh, fuck, I still got myself hurt. Unfucking believable. There's, these are like the easiest enemies in the game, and I got hit three times by this one guy on level ground. And what's the point of the extra keys anyways? Is there a score counter anywhere in the game? Even if there was, it still wouldn't be worth it. Yeah, watch me try to inch my way forward without touching the grenade. Got it. Alright, that's level 8. And sometimes the key literally ends up right on top of the grenade. Good thing those extra keys are optional. I mean, I guess I could try. Yeah, well, I don't know what I expected. Okay, stage nine. Swim your way through sharks, mines, and a strong undercurrent to find the submarine base. By undercurrent, they mean the screen auto-scrolls. 
fucking brilliant. The first time I ever made it this far, I didn't realize that that's what it meant, so of course I died within seconds. And that was on my last continue then, too, so then the whole game was over. Imagine getting all the way to stage 9, only to be fucked over like that. Honestly, the only reason I've ever been able to make it this far is because I've played the game over and over again as I was taking notes and all the weird shit that there is to comment on. Oh shit! Looks like the shark's dorsal fin touched Superman's tippy toe, so he fucking died again. I mean, really. I can kick a grenade in level 3, but can't do that? And another time I died when I just touched a wall, and it wasn't like I got caught between the wall and the edge of the screen. It was near the center. Sort of. I really don't get this one. I had about half of my health bar left, and it's not like an enemy suddenly appeared from the far right side, so what the fuck? And of course, if you get hurt by something, you dive down automatically just as if you were flying. Which can be really dangerous, because you can easily get caught between a wall and the edge of the screen that way. Also, to my disappointment, this level reuses the same music we got from Stage 6. Up to this point, the first eight stages all had their own unique pieces of music. Now, if you're gonna reuse any piece of music, though, why not the one from Stage 4? That was an underwater level, too, if that matters, and it was much more catchy. And after all that, you get to Stage 10 only for it to turn out to be one of the least difficult stages yet. I suppose, then, that it's fitting that Stage 10 uses the same music as Stage 1, since they're both among the easiest stages in the whole game, after all. It is the same sort of appearance as Stage 6, but the layout seems somewhat closer to being more linear. There are two different kinds of robots that shoot bullets at you, and they're both different from the crab-like robot in Stage 6. One shoots their bullets at a height where you can easily punch them back, but the other shoots its bullets at maybe knee height, and you can still punch it back somehow. Shitty consistency, but that's lucky for me, I suppose. And they both only require one hit to defeat, so I probably shouldn't complain at this point. I still feel like a dumbass feeling like I need to punch the air preemptively for whenever they decide to turn around. Check this shit out. In these enclosed spaces, sometimes you kill an enemy holding a key and it flings it up like it's partway lodged inside the ceiling. What the hell's that about? Shouldn't it just stay at ground level? Sometimes it flat-out clips through the ceiling's collision detection entirely and is unreachable. Why would I want the invincibility at this point? Let me just sneak by and drop down... Ah, damn it. Well, I might as well get it now, I guess. Oh, cool. The invincibility wore off just when I arrived at the final boss. Not that I need it, but it still feels disappointing, I guess. Well, just like in Stage 3, you can easily beat him back until he's up against the wall. Once you're positioned correctly, you don't need to do anything other than tap the B button repeatedly to defeat him. It only takes 10 hits, I don't even need a turbo button on my emulator for this. And there you have it. That's the whole game. First you get the usual message at the end of the level. And then you get the final congratulations screen, and they didn't even have the decency to give you special victory music. You just get the same tune that plays whenever you beat any of the other levels. And I think the game gets stuck here because it doesn't matter what buttons I press, it never responds again. Not that it matters so much, because what are you gonna do? Play the whole game again if it takes you back to the beginning? I had to play this game several times in order to get good enough to beat it, and by the time I could beat it and started gathering footage, my main playthrough that I recorded was just under 18 minutes. The story barely made any sense. Maybe the instruction booklet can clarify some things. I can't believe I still have some of these. Nor can I believe that apparently I had the Game Boy Advance port for Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets this whole time, and I must have completely forgotten about it. And given that more than half of my videos are Harry Potter related, I'd have to say that that's pretty embarrassing. Anyways, if you wanted, you can probably find PDF files of various Game Boy instruction booklets on the internet. I'll just go through this digital version here for convenience. So basically, the story is that some citizens disappeared and you're searching for them. But if you were looking for a prison of captured people, why couldn't they have rewarded the player with some kind of a cutscene or explained the story a little more thoroughly in the game itself? This kind of background story could have made for a cool introductory cutscene, too. And maybe they were under a time crunch or something.
I mean, sure, when you buy the game, you get the booklet, so maybe they're assuming you read it. But how many kids are going to read the booklet beforehand? I'm sure a few will, but I think more often than not, they're going to go straight to playing the game. Oh sure, you have bits of text that tell you what Superman is doing before each stage begins, but the game itself never tells you why. So you miss that bit of motivation unless you read the booklet first. The next three pages are longer descriptions of each stage. Not much to say here, except that the description for stage 4 really bothers me. The Lexoscale 5000 is standing guard to the entrance of a secret passage located inside the LexCorp warehouse. The passage is a secret trap door which leads to the sea. Superman dives into the unknown. Most of that is just describing the end of the previous stage, though. Then there's a page dedicated to the hero Superman himself. They spell the word fortress correctly in the booklet, at least. I don't know why they couldn't have done that in the game itself. Alright, what else? There's a boost control? Up and B, what does that do? Oh, okay, it basically makes it easier for you to die. You can't do it while flying either, you just keep punching the air if you try to do that. So forget what I said about Superman being equally fast when walking or flying. Turns out he's potentially faster on the ground if he wants to be. I really don't see the point, unless you're able to outrun a bullet this way. Oh shit, it worked! So I guess the boost thing... can still be used for something, technically speaking. Very impractical though, so I don't see the point. Other than to say that this version of Superman can, in fact, be faster than a speeding bullet if he really wants to. I mean, for real, it took me several tries to set up that shot just to test that crap out. But it was kind of cool to see, as impractical as it actually is, in practice. Okay, let's see. Enemies... The Lexoscale 5000 can shoot kryptonite missiles? It can? I don't remember that. Well, let's see here. Oh shit, yeah, it did something. I can probably get a better view from up here. Well, that's interesting. I never would have known that unless I'd read the booklet, since it's so easy to defeat and overwhelm what seems to be built up as the biggest and baddest looking enemy in the whole game. There's another page of enemies here, and in order to hurt Superman, they're equipped with kryptonite bullets. Okay. <sighs> So on the one hand, that makes sense and explains how their bullets are able to hurt Superman at all. But on the other hand, if those bullets are made of kryptonite, how is he able to punch them back? Like I said early on when I just assumed these were normal bullets, I was willing to suspend my disbelief because it's a balancing act of staying faithful to the source material and not making the game too easy. But now it's even harder to suspend my disbelief now that this clarification has come to my attention. <laughs> what the fuck? Alright, the grenades and underwater mines are also full of kryptonite. Fine. And I'm okay with the electric current hurting him too, but the sharks are just normal sharks, right? That would make sense for them to be normal, since as far as I could tell, they don't really come after you. They only hurt you if you touch them, which is pretty stupid since they're not shooting kryptonite bullets at you. May as well have just had some underwater robot that can shoot that at Superman instead. Digital keys. You will have to collect a fixed number of keys. Uh, no. Correction. You have to collect a minimum number of keys. So the booklet got that wrong. I mean, that's a nitpick. It's not like having extra keys really hurts the game in any way, but I probably have OCD, so I'm good at nitpicking. What I'm not good at sometimes is figuring out how to end the video in a professional manner, but... This game didn't even try to give the player a satisfactory ending, so why should I? Actually, no. The best thing I could do is sum up this game's bullshit with one final clip. Superman punched this alien through its fucking skull, and he still got killed. <laughs>